Let me just open up in prayer. So Lord, we just, uh, just thank you this, for this opportunity to worship together here. And um, I just thank you for this congregation here in, in Lewistown, Lord. Um, I just pray for just my words in the next few minutes, Lord, that uh, I'll just be free of any sense of self and, you know, wanting to sound good or look good, Lord. But we just know that every time we get in your presence, you have something for us, Lord. You have something to speak to us, Lord. You want to touch us, Lord. God, there's freedom in your presence. And so, Lord, we just ask you to come. We need you, Jesus. Amen. Cool. So I am Shayi. I don't think I've met most of you. I've met a few of you, but I'm Shayi. I go to the Calvary Midtown gathering, and so really excited to be here. This is my first time in, in Lewistown. Um, and so the last few weeks, we've been going through a sermon series called Summer School, and um, just talking about what we've learned in the last year or so of, of our lives. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've learned in the last year and also like over the course of my whole life, you know, just some major life lessons I've had. And one of the passages, passages you've probably heard a few times is out of Jeremiah 6, 16, where it says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that passage in a little bit. But So over the last year, you know, it was a difficult year. You know, it was a transition, transitionary year for a lot of us. And for me, it was like, it was like a really different year, you know, not just with the pandemic. Um, so I did 10 years of school as a Penn State student. I did undergrad and grad school, which is way too much school for anyone. I don't suggest it at all, but I did it. And so I literally was a student my entire life from the time I was four years old up till now I'm in my 20s. I'm not going to tell you exactly what age, but late 20s. That entire time, I had never taken a semester where I was not a student. And so that was like literally all I knew. And so back in August, I finished school, and now I'm working for Calvary. And, you know, when you're a student, you can always kind of like put things, like when you're planning your life or you're thinking about goals, you always think in terms of like, all right, when I'm out of school, you know, I'll get into that, I'll think about that. And that's the way I always was, of like just, you know, certain things I wanted direction in my life, I, I postponed and thought about, you know, like that's going to happen later. And so when I was finally not a student, you know, it brought up a lot of questions, you know, with, with God of like the direction of my life. Like, am I in the right place? Am I going in the right direction? And you know, just in general, not just with life, I'm just really bad at figuring out directions. I'm really bad with directions. I'm bad when there's lots of different options. Like, specifically, I'm really bad with directions when it comes to driving. And, you know, from the time, like, I, like, you know, from the time I was a kid, you know, watching my parents drive, I would never pay attention, you know, to where we were going. You know, I'd always fall asleep in the car, and then we'd magically be where we're trying to go. And, you know, thank God when I started driving, it's when GPS started being, like, really popular. So I never actually had to get good at directions. I never had to learn how to use a map. And so it really was perfect timing. And so, you know, even now, if someone's trying to, like, give me directions for somewhere, I'll literally just either tune them out or tell them to just, hey, please just stop. Give me the address. I'll put it in my GPS. You know, and they'll be like, no, no, it's easy to get there. I'm like, trust me, just give me the address. You know, there, there was like a year and a half where I was going from State College to Montgomery County every weekend. That was like three hours away. And for a year and a half, almost every weekend I was going there. And I hate to admit that I still use the GPS to get there. That's how bad I am with directions. And, you know, with, with directions, you know, the, the difficulty is, is that there's so many options as to where you can go. You can go left, you can go straight, you can go right. And then once you make a decision there, then you can go left, you can go straight, you can go right. And you can literally end up in an infinite amount of different locations. You know, it would be easier if there was just one road to go down for everything, you know, if there was no options. And so when it, when it comes down to it, you know, with, with driving, with things in life, you know, I find myself oftentimes incapable of knowing what direction to take. And I know that I need help. I need guidance. And so this passage I read in Jeremiah 6.16 you know, it's this promise that God would give us guidance, where it says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. And so that's, that's a promise that God's going to show, you know, the Israelite people where they need to go. And so this passage is in, in the book of Jeremiah, and 
Jeremiah was called to be a prophet to Israel. He was called to warn them to, to repent of their sins. And so Israel was God's chosen people. They had been given instructions as to how they were to live, and they were breaking those instructions. You know, they had been worshiping false gods and, and a lot of different things that go along with that. And Jeremiah was called to warn them of God's judgment that would come upon them if they didn't repent. And so this verse, Jeremiah 6.16, was in the midst of the Lord through Jeremiah warning the people to turn from their sins. And in verse 16, he's giving them a way out. That even though they've gone far down the wrong path, there was always a way back to God. There was always a way to find true rest. You know, this, the entire Old Testament was really, you know, the story of Israel's history to, to where they could really find rest. You know, like there was this cycle of, you know, the Israelites following God and then turning to false gods and then turning back. You know, it was just like a constant yo-yo. And, and one, of the, one of the places where you see an example of, of the Israelites serving God and then turning away from him was in the book of Joshua, into the book of Judges. You know, in Joshua chapter 24, it said that the whole time Joshua was alive, so Joshua was Moses' successor, and he faithfully served the Lord. And, and as long as Joshua was in charge, as, as long as Joshua was lead, leading, you know, as long as his memory was alive, you know, they all served God. You know, every, the whole time that they experienced all the miracles God did through Joshua, they served God. But then it says in Judges, in Judges chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, it says an other, another generation came up, and they no longer witnessed what God had done. They started following the gods around them. And it says they aroused the Lord's anger. And there was a verse repeated in Judges a few times, and, and one of the times that this verse was repeated was in Judges chapter 21, verse 25, where it says, There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They didn't want to live under anyone else's authority. You know, judges, you read about some of the just most horrific moral decay of just like just so many stories of the way people were behaving was just so, you know, unbelievable even to, you know, our culture of like, man, they really, really lost it. And that's what happened when the Israelites rejected God. And so you see this pattern throughout the Old Testament with the Israelites where God shows up, he does miraculous things, the Israelites proclaim their loyalty to him, and then over time they start to drift. They forget about what God has done. You know, it's, they start to feel like the works of God are just old relics of the past. And, and all they have left, they feel like, are laws to just abide by. And they begin to become enticed by the ways of the world around them. And they begin to worship false idols. And so this is the same thing happening in Jeremiah, where all of a sudden the idols around them seem to start attractive. They want them to worship like the people around them. And God says in Jeremiah 6.16, it's the ancient paths. It was the way set before you from the beginning that's ultimately going to bring you the rest that you want. Because you know, at the end of the day, we all want rest for our souls. You know, we want, we want satisfaction out of life. We want happiness. We want to feel loved. We want to feel peace. You know, we want to feel joy. Every single being has that desire. You know, but we have this proneness when God seems distant to start to feel like that we're, that we're better served finding our rest somewhere else. When God seems distant, the ancient paths start to seem irrelevant and out of touch. So the, the road the Israelites went down reminded me a lot of my own story coming to faith. And um, I'm going to go pretty in-depth with, with my testimony because I just feel so much parallel between the Israelite people and some of the journey of my own, my own life. And so... I've been a Christian for eight and a half years now, and um, I grew up in a very devout Christian home. You know, both of my parents loved Jesus a whole lot. You know, they both gave their lives, lives to the Lord during college. And so when I was a kid, I was in church, you know, multiple times a week. You know, we did family devotions together in the morning. We would listen to Focus on the Family. You know, my favorite show on the radio was called Adventures in Odyssey. It was on at 7.30 p.m. Um, I'd watch Veggie Tales. I would listen to WoW hit CDs. I used to go to Awana. I don't know if you guys know any of these references. I think some of you do. Anyone go to Awana, by the way, when they're younger? Yes, that's where it's at. And so, you know, and also my, my parents are Nigerian, and one thing's Nigerian Christian, like this tradition they have, is that on New Year's Eve, you would go to a prayer meeting. And now that sounds like, hey, that's cool. But like when I was a kid, that's not cool. It's not cool. <laughs> And so, I don't, know, I don't know if we went every year, but we went often enough for me to, you know, remember it. And so we, we'd go to this prayer meeting, and um, 
you know, me and my two brothers are there like half asleep and people are crying out to God. And when I mean crying out to God, like Africans pray loud. So it's like, you know, you fall asleep, you're going to be woken up by someone like screaming right in your ear. And so, you know, it, it goes long, you know, it goes on past midnight. And then, you know, I start praying, but I'm not praying for like anything they're praying for. I'm praying for like, God, when is this going to end? It's past midnight. We did the thing. Let's go home. I want to go to bed. And so I was, you know, I was in church. Like, I, I was really in church, like, a lot. And I was around a lot of church people. I was around a lot of followers of Jesus. But I never really encountered God for myself. You know, he had never become real to me in a personal way. So I, I heard the gospel. I knew so many of the Bible stories. But when I grew older, God seemed distant to me. And so the, the ways of the Lord, the ancient paths, began to seem irrelevant and out of touch and so um, I was born in Canada, in Vancouver, and I lived there till I was eight. And my family, when we lived there, I went to a Christian school, and so like most of my friends and like family friends, you know, were all Christians. Um, but when I was eight, I moved over to the Middle East, and I moved to Dubai with my family. And that was like a totally different world, because, you know, before I was in a, kind of a Christian bubble, and now, you know, it's like a Muslim area. And... I mean, we still went to church. Somehow they still had Awana out there in Dubai, <laughs> like, which is pretty sweet. But, but from school, you know, like, like almost none of my friends were, were Christians. I knew about one guy who was like definitely a believer. And um, other than that, I didn't really know anyone who was a Christian. And, um, you know, over time, I started to develop the beginning of kind of a double life where, you know, I'd, I'd go to youth camps. Over summer, we'd go to youth camps in like Washington State and I'd come forward at every altar call. I must have gotten saved like 50 plus times, you know, and I was a good Christian kid, but, you know, at school, I was someone totally different. You know, when, when I was living in Dubai, we went to this private school with, with a lot of kids whose parents, you know, just kind of worked a lot and let them do like whatever they wanted. And so like I had, my parents were relatively more strict, whereas my friend's parents were really loose with them. And I wanted the same freedom they had to do kind of whatever they wanted. You know, earlier I talked about how ultimately we all want to find rest for our souls. And so many times the issue is that we're deceived about where we're going to find it. And so for me, something shifted in my heart where, where God and his ways started to feel irrelevant at that point in my life. And I started to think that the, the rest I was looking for, for my soul, the path to true satisfaction, was in being able to do whatever I wanted to do. You know, to have less rules and restrictions around my life. You know, that was freedom to me. And so, end of middle school, going into high school, um, I moved to Pennsylvania in 10th grade to, to Westchester. And, um, you know, I started getting into different things. And, and for me, the dream was, like, going to college. I wanted to go to, like, a big party school, which is actually why I first came to Penn State. And my older brother went there. I'd visit him senior year. And, um, and I just dreamed about, like, I can't wait to get out of my parents' roof. And that's where I'm going to find real joy. That's, that's honestly what I thought. And so freshman year of undergrad, I, I came to Penn State, and um, anyone else go to Penn State, by the way? Nice. That's actually less of you than I would have thought, but sweet. Yeah, Penn State. Um, and so my game plan for going to Penn State was pretty simple. Um, I'm going to dive deep into, like, the party culture, and I'm going to get good enough grades to where my parents, you know, don't, like, come down on me and, like, pull me out of school or something. And so that was, that was the plan. You know, because, again, I, God seemed distant to me, and I thought, this is where I'm going to find satisfaction. And, you know, growing up, like, I, I heard about stories about what God had done, you know, in my parents' life, in other people's life, and I believed it was true. You know, I knew about the ways of God, but I had never truly encountered God for myself. And so when I went to school, you know, I'm going to spare you, like, all the details, but I went pretty wild, you know, every weekend going out, you know, like, blacking out almost every weekend, and somehow my grades were still, like, like really good. But then sophomore year hit, and I started to struggle with, like, depression really bad. And, like, my behavior just started to become really, really erratic. And then my grades started to drop. You know, there, there was one semester, sophomore year, where, like, I barely left my room other than, other than weekends. I was, like, just sleeping all the time. I had a pint of Ben & Jerry's, like, every day for, like, a month. And I still love Ben & Jerry's. Like, it was mostly Cherry Garcia. There's nothing wrong with eating some Ben & Jerry's, but every day a pint you know, that's a problem. It's a little excessive. And so I knew something was happening to me that wasn't good. And then going into junior year, you know, I started to feel something that I never felt before. You know, I started to feel conviction of my sin. 
You know, I, I had always experienced a general sense of guilt and shame because I, like, I knew God was real. I knew a lot of the things I was doing was wrong. But this was different. This was conviction. It wasn't just like a feeling, a sense that God was mad at me. You know, I was actually starting to see how my actions were actually harming myself. I started to see how it was robbing me of, of being who I was meant to be. And that God really was reaching out to me, and I had erected a barrier between myself and him through my sin. And so um, that semester, junior year, um, I, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, I saw this flyer for this campus ministry, and, you know, over the years, like, I, would, I would never, like, I would go to church when I was home because I had to, but I would never go to church, you know, at, at school. I had a Bible because my mom made me pack one. I would never read it. Um, but I saw this flyer, and something clicked where it's just like, I should go to that, you know? And before, I, it's almost like I didn't know that there was any other Christian groups, like, on campus. I literally thought that, like, everyone at Penn State either, like, doesn't do anything that I go, or they go out and get drunk every weekend. That's what I thought. And so, like, it wasn't even in my head that there were Christian groups. But I saw this flyer, and I thought, like, hey, I, sh- I should go. And then I started to, you know, second-guess myself because I thought, hey, what are my friends going to think? Because I really only had a few, like, real, like, real friends at that point. And so a week or two later, um, I'm talking with a friend who um, I had known since high school. He went to the same high school. He also came to Penn State. And so we were kind of in the same friend group. And we, were, we just ran into each other one day, and we were walking home. We both, like, lived near each other. And we just started talking about God, about Christianity, about morality. And I used to avoid those kind of conversations like the plague because I knew I was running away from God. I didn't want to confront it. But for some reason, we just started talking about it. And he was just, I didn't know, but he talked about how he also was raised in a Christian home, and he felt like he needed to start getting back into his faith. And we just started talking about how, you know, like I read that verse in the book of Judges where it says, like, there was no king in the land. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In other words, people just did whatever they wanted. And I felt like that was so true for my life, and he felt like that was so true for his life, where there was nothing, like, guiding him, or, like, there was no moral compass guiding him. And then he said, hey, I saw this flyer for this Bible study. Do you want to go? And it was the exact same campus ministry. It was the same flyer I had seen, and I didn't go because I was afraid what my friends were going to think. So God literally sent one of my closest friends to come and invite me to the same campus ministry. And so I started going, um, and it's crazy it was the same flyer because it was not a big campus ministry or anything, but we started going, and, and over time, I just started to really, like, just, feel like God's nearness. I I started to feel just this rearrangement in my heart that said, this is where I'm going to find rest for my soul. Like, this is where I'm going to find that satisfaction I was looking for. And I I realized that even in in my lifestyle of just like kind of going out and going wild, I had never really found what it was I thought I was looking for. And so I gave gave my life life to Christ. and, um, And even after giving my life to Christ, though, I was still searching out this just sense of God's nearness that I never felt before, that I heard people talk about. You know, there's this, there's this quote by St. Augustine, or Augustine, I don't know how to say his name, but he says this thing where he says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And I still kind of felt this restlessness of my heart of like, I really, really want to, you know, experience God in a real way. And so when I, you know, when I got saved, I was, you know, I was in, I was kind of, it was kind of like a return to my childhood where I was in church multiple times a week, but now I was like doing it willingly. So I was like going to like everything. I was going to like, you know, men's groups, different campus ministries. And, and I got to the point though where I really felt like I wanted to meet God in like a real personal way. And um, I started reading these books that talked about, you know, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and I, I got to the point one day where I, I just prayed and I just said to God, like, I'm not going to I'm not going to sleep. I'm not going to eat. I don't think I even drink water until, like, I like, have a real sense of, like, being filled with the Spirit, of encountering the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, didn't have much of an understanding of anything of really what I was praying for. And um, I, during that time, I 
started texting people to apologize for things. Like I was like repenting of like old sins. I like emailed a professor to, told, to tell him I like cheated on a homework assignment, which is like really random because everyone used to do that. But I just felt this sense of like, I want to be clean before God, like let everything go to just really be near to him. So that night I ended up going to the Walmart parking lot in my car and was just like blasting worship music. And, and the next morning I, I'm praying with my campus ministry pastor and his wife. And we were, we were just praying that like, like I would encounter the Holy Spirit in a real way, that he'd become real to me, that he'd become personal to me. And as I was leaving the church, I was listening to the song, Oh, How I Love Jesus. And I don't know how to describe it other than, you know, the presence of God just like seemed to fill the car. And I started weeping uncontrollably. And, you know, even still now, like, if, you know, if I feel like, like I'm experiencing the Holy Spirit or like there's a truth that really speaks to my heart from the Bible, you know, I might like, I might cry a little bit, but I'm not like by nature like one of those like criers, but I was like, the tears were like flooding and I like pulled over the car and I was just weeping like under the experience of just feeling God's love for me. And it was something I'd read about, it was something I believed, but like in that moment, like it was like God was making it personal to me. And, you know, we were singing that song earlier about, um, you know, I'm caught up in your presence. That song, um, what's it called by Cody Carnes? Nothing else, you know? Like, I never want to leave this moment. You know, that's that's how I felt. And and it was in that moment that, like, it was like everything got convinced in my life, in my heart, that, like, even though, you know, I'd gone through a million ups and downs with my faith and, and different things, like, I knew that there was nothing I had ever experienced in my life that brought me rest like when I felt the presence of God like that. And, and since then, it's like, it's like the path, the ancient path of pursuing God with everything has just hopefully become the compass that has like guided my life. You know, earlier I talked about when God seems distant, the ancient paths become, seem irrelevant and out of touch. But when God becomes near, it becomes just the thing that makes by far the most sense in life. And, you know, in, in my whole journey in like finding Christ, there was something that happened where I was so hardened towards God. Yet like the Holy Spirit worked in such a way in convicting me of my sin, of convicting me of truth. Like even, you know, before I got saved, like it was like Bible verses just started flooding into my mind that I didn't even know I remembered. Stuff like my dad used to tell me when I was a kid that all of a sudden started to make so much sense to me. You know, it was God drawing me to himself. And, and I asked God like, God, like, you made that so easy for me to accept you. Like, can you do that for other people? Can you encounter other people in a real way like that? And so out of that, I started, I started reading about revival. I started reading about, like, moves of God in the past where just people started to encounter God and the tide was turned in a certain direction to draw people towards himself. And I'm just going to talk about, about one of these revivals called, it's called the Jesus People Movement. Has anyone ever heard of the Jesus People Movement? One, okay, cool. You're in for some good stories. So, um, so the Jesus Movement was in the, the late 60s and early 70s, and the, the culture of the time was very similar to the culture of today. You know, I just listened to like this YouTube video like a, a month ago where they're talking about for every person, you know, like becoming a born-again Christian, four people are leaving the church right now, the younger generations. For every one person coming in, four people are leaving. And so when you look at like millennials and like Gen Z, the the rate at which people are leaving the church is like, it's a real crisis. It's like, you know, 20 years, 40 years, 60 years from now, things could look very different if God doesn't intervene. And Similarly, in the late 60s and early 70s, you know, there was a time of the, the countercultural movement, the hippie movement, you know, where it seemed like the younger generations of baby boomers had just kind of rejected all kinds of tradition and, and religion and, and all these types of things. And we're, we're getting into drugs, we're getting into promiscuity, we're getting into the new age. And it looked like a whole generation was lost, you know, to, to the ways of God. And, and during that time, there's a lot of parents, you know, Christian parents who are worried about their kids just kind of, you know, going wild. And, and during that time, um, in, the, yeah, in the late 60s or early 70s, beginning in California, a number of people who were part of that countercultural movement became, like, they got saved. They became born again. And they started spreading the gospel all around California. And, and pretty soon, you know, all of these, you know, like, 
you know, hippies, you know, with their long hair and like not wearing shoes and all that stuff. Like people were like doing like acid and having visions of Jesus and like getting saved and turning their whole life around and like repenting. And that's not me advocating like doing drugs to find Jesus. Just want to clarify, God intervened in the midst of their drug trip. Okay, just want to make sure I'm not starting any weird things. Um, but yeah, people were just finding Jesus in like all kinds of ways. And you know, when people would get saved, like they would, they would literally, because a lot of them, they were just like wandering around homeless because it was just a bunch of, you know, teenagers, people in their 20s just like wandering around doing drugs. Like they would literally form these like Christian communes, you know, all over. It started in California, but it literally went all over the nation. And it would be people that like looked like hippies. They were like playing rock and roll, but now they're singing like, they're making Jesus songs. They still look the same, but their whole lives are radically different. And this like this movement, it got national attention. Like, it ended up in a bunch of magazines. Like, I think it was in 1971 or 1972. Like, on the cover of Time magazine, they had, like, this psychedelic version of Jesus on the, on the cover. And I think the, the title was, like, the Jesus People Revolution or something. And so, you know, one pastor estimated that, you know, at the peak, there was, like, 300,000, you know, young people who were part of this Jesus People movement. And the crazy thing about it was that it literally came out of nowhere. Like, no one was predicting it. Then all of a sudden, so many people were coming to know Jesus. I heard of one person who was like, I think he was living in California during the time of the Jesus movement. He said this thing about like, you could literally just say boo, and someone would get saved. You know, just the rate at which people would just like, start turning to Jesus in a radical way. You know, it was just really, um, just really inspiring. And, you know, for, for me, you know, for us, I think that's really, when it comes to asking for the ancient past where people will find rest, you know, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you found that way. And just with the times we live in, I think there needs to be just this deep cry in our heart that God would help other people, you know, find that path in a way that just, I don't know, just really changes our region, changes central PA. You know, I'm sure you've heard of Pastor Dan talk about the, the vision to see the number of Christ followers in central PA double. And the worship team can come up as I close, but there's this, there's this uh, passage in Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2, um, which I've come back to a lot because it expresses, I feel like, what I have in my heart, what a lot of us should have in our hearts, where it says, Lord, I have, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. You know, Habakkuk is, you know, he's remembering a time where, where God was near. You know, where the, where the miracles of the Lord were, were present and people were following God with their whole heart. And he's, and he's living in a time where it feels like God seems distant from people and people are just, fall, like, just going in all these different crazy directions and he's asking for a restoration you know, of people seeing you know, the road, people seeing the ancient path. You know, and I really believe you know, you know, for our day, for every day, that, that every generation needs a fresh encounter with God. Every generation needs a fresh encounter with God. I think of all the people who who come to Penn State campus every year, and I've been there, like I said, a long, a long time. I'm not a student anymore, but I still live in downtown State College, work in college student ministry now. And, and it's just my prayer that they would, they, they would have, you know, a fresh encounter with God, that the ways of God would become real to them. I'm just going to read Jeremiah 6, verse 16, one more time. If I can pull it up in my notes. Where it says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. Let me just close in prayer. Lord, we just, uh, we just thank you that you've given us the way to, to life, the way to rest, the way to true satisfaction and joy. And Lord, so we just ask that you would, uh, that you would make it known, Lord Jesus. God, even in just this month with CWOW Sunday, the, the focus is the next generation, Lord. There's a lot of people who, they've heard about you, but they don't know you. And God, I know, I know what you did for me. I know what you did for probably many of us in this room, Lord, 
where it went from knowing about you to, to knowing you. It was a work of your Spirit in, in drawing us to yourself, Lord. Lord, we just pray in, in our day, Lord Jesus, God, that you would make your ways known to us, Lord. God, I just pray for every parent, every grandparent here in this room, Lord, who have um, children, grandchildren that they're praying for, that they would find these ancient paths, Lord. God, we ask you just as my, my mother and, and just my father and different people were praying for me, Lord, and you drew me in by your spirit, Lord. I just pray that you will do that um, in the lives of their kids and their grandchildren, Lord. God, we thank you that even when things seem to look bleak in terms of the direction people are going, Lord, there are so many times throughout biblical history, Lord, and history after that, Lord, where you intervened when it seemed unexpected, Lord, where your presence came in and enveloped a region in such a way where it just felt like people were flocking to churches, Lord, like a magnet. People were flocking to a relationship with you like a magnet, where it became more attractive than, than Penn State football games or Thon or different things that captivate, you know, that are good things, but captivate people's hearts, Lord Jesus. God, we ask you to do that again in our day, Lord Jesus. God, we need a move of your spirit, Lord Jesus. God, we just proclaim that you are the way, the truth, and the life, Lord. We just proclaim that there's nowhere else that we find eternal life. Lord, so I just pray that you would make it known to our hearts in a deeper way, Lord, and make it known um, to the people around us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.